All right. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, I'm going to read the Sovereignty of God, chapter four, but I'm only going to read the first section. We'll divide this chapter into three sections as I'm doing it, and I'll, I'll label this one uh, section one, and then we'll have two more sections for chapter three. So I'm just going to read the first section of chapter three today. It says, oh, the debt, oh, actually, it says the sovereignty of God, chapter four, the sovereignty of God in salvation. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Romans eleven thirty three. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah two and nine. But the Lord does not save all. Why not? He does save some. Then if he saves some, why not others? Is it because they are too sinful or, and depraved? No, for the apostle wrote, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy 1.15 Therefore, if God saved the chief of sinners, none are excluded because of their depravity. Why then does God not save all? Is it because some are too stony-hearted to be won? No, because it is written that God will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh, Ezekiel eleven nineteen. Then is it becomes because some are stubborn, so intractable, so defiant that God is unable to woo them to himself? Before we answer this question, let us ask another. Let us appeal to the experience of the Christian reader. Friend, was there not a time when you walked in the counsel of the ungodly and stood in the way of sinners? It sat in the seat of scorners, and with them said, We will not have this man to reign over us. Luke 19, 14. Was there not a time when you would not come to Christ that you might have life? John 5, 40. Yea, was there not a time when you mingled your voice with those who said unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways? What is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto Him? Job 21, 14 and 15. With shame face, you have to acknowledge that there was. There was a time that you did all these things and I did all these things. But how is it that all is now changed? What was it that brought you from haughty self-sufficiency to a humble suppliant? From one that was at enmity with God to one that is at peace with, it, with him. From lawlessness to subjection. From hate to love. And as one born of the Spirit, you will readily reply, By the grace of God I am what I am. 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 15 and 10. Then do you not see that it is due to no lack of power in God? nor to his refusal to coerce man that other rebels are not saved too? If God was able to subdue your will and win your heart, and that without interfering with your moral responsibility, then is he not able to do the same for others? Assuredly he is. Then how inconsistent, how illogical, how foolish of you in seeking to account for the present course of the, of the wicked and their un... un in their ultimate fate, to argue that God is unable to save them, that they will not let him. Do you say, but the time came when I was willing, willing to receive Christ as my Savior? True, but it was the Lord who made you willing. Psalm 110 and 3 and Philippians 2.13. Why, why then does he not make all sinners willing? Why? Why? but for the fact that he is sovereign and does as he pleases. But return to our opening question or inquiry. 
Why is it that all are not saved, particularly all who hear the gospel? Do you still answer because the majority refuse to believe? Well, that is true, but it is only part of the truth. It is the truth from the human side. But there is a divine side too, and this side of the truth needs to be stressed or God will be robbed of his glory. The unsaved are lost because they refuse to believe. The others are saved because they believe. But why do these others believe? What is it that causes them to put their trust in Christ? Is it because they are more intelligent than their fellows and quicker to discern their need of salvation? Perish the thought. Who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? 1 Corinthians 4 and 7. It is God himself who maketh the difference between the elect and the non-elect. For of his own it is written, and we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. 1 John 5 and 20. Faith is, the, is God's gift, and all men have not faith, 2 Thessalonians 3 and 2. Therefore we see that God does not bestow his gift upon all. Upon whom then does he bestow his saving favor? And we answer upon, answer upon his own elect. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed, Acts 13.48. Hence it is that we read of the faith of God's elect in Titus 1 and 1. But is God partial in the distribution of his favors? Has he not the right to be? Are there still some who murmur against the good man of the house? Then his own words are a su sufficient reply. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Matthew 20 and 15. God is sovereign in the bestowment of his gifts, both in the natural and in the spiritual realms. So much then for a general statement, and now to particularize. We're going to read through this entire section right here. The sovereignty of God the Father in salvation. And we'll save the last two for the next videos. Perhaps the one scripture which most emphatically of all asserts the absolute sovereignty of God in connection with his determining the destiny of his creatures is the ninth of Romans. We shall not attempt to review here the entire chapter, but we'll confine ourselves to verses 21 through 23. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory? These verses represent fallen man as inert and as impotent as a lump of lifeless clay. This scripture evidences that there is no difference in themselves between the elect and the non-elect. They are clay of the same lump, which agrees with Ephesians 2 and 3. We are told that all are by nature children of wrath. It teaches us that the ultimate destiny of every individual is decided by the will of God. And blessed it is that such be the case. If it were left to our wills, the ultimate destination of us all would be the lake of fire. It declares that God himself does make a difference in the respective destinations to which he assigns his creatures. For one, is, one vessel is made unto honor and another unto dishonor. Some are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Others are vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory. We readily acknowledge that it is very humbling to the proud heart of the creature to behold all mankind in the hand of God as the clay in the potter's hand. 
Yet this is precisely how the scriptures of truth represent the case. In this day of human boasting, intellectual pride, and deification of man, it needs to be insisted upon that the potter forms his vessels for himself. Let man strive with his maker as he wills. The fact remains that he is nothing more than clay in the heavenly potter's hands. And while we know that God will deal justly with his creatures, that the judge of all the earth will do right, nevertheless, he shapes his vessel for his own purpose and according to his own pleasure. God claims the indisputable right to do as he wills with his own. Not only has God the right to do as he wills with the creatures of his own hands, but he exercises this right, and nowhere is that seen more plainly than in his predestinating grace. Before the foundation of the world, God made a choice a selection, an election. Before his omniscient eye stood the whole of Adam's race, race, and from it he singled out a people and predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son, ordained them to eternal life. Many are the scriptures which set forth this blessed truth, seven of which will now engage our attention. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Acts 13, 48. Every artifice of human ingenuity has been employed to blunt the sharp edge of this scripture and to explain away the obvious meaning of these words. But it has been employed in vain, though nothing will ever be able to reconcile this and similar passages into the mind of the natural man. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Here we learn four things. First, that believing is the consequence and not the cause of God's decree. Second, that a limited number only are ordained to eternal life. For if all men without exception were thus ordained by God, then the words, as many as, are a meaningless qualification. Third, that this ordination of God is not to mere external privileges, but to eternal life, not to service, but to salvation itself. Fourth, that all, as many as, not one less, who are thus ordained by God to eternal life will most certainly believe. The comments of the beloved Spurgeon on the above passages are well worthy of our notice. Said he, Attempts have been made to prove that these words do not teach predestination, but these attempts so clearly do violate violence to language that I shall not waste time in answering them. I read, As many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and I shall not twist the text, but shall glorify the grace of God by ascribing to that grace the faith of every man. Is it not God who gives the disposition to believe? If men were disposed to have eternal life, does not he, in every case, dispose them? Is it wrong for God to give grace? If it be right for him to give it, is it wrong for him to purpose to give it? Would you have him give it by accident? If it, if it is right for him to purpose to give grace today, it was right for him to purpose it before today. And since he changes not from eternity, even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Romans 11, 5 and 6. The words even so at the beginning of this quotation refer us to the previous verse where we are told, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Note particularly the word reserved. In the days of Elijah, there were 7,000, a small minority who were divinely preserved from idolatry 
and brought to the knowledge of the true God. This preservation and illumination was not from anything in themselves, but solely by God's special influence and agency. How highly favored such individuals were to be thus reserved by God. Now, says the apostle, just as there was a remnant in Elijah's days reserved by God, even so there is in this present dispensation a remnant according to the election of grace. Here the cause of election is traced back to its source. The basis upon which God elected this remnant was not faith foreseen in them, because a choice founded upon foresight of good works is just as truly made on the grounds of works as any choice can be. And in such a case it would be would not be of grace. For says the apostle, if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace, which means that grace and works are opposites. They have nothing in common and will no more mingle than oil and water. Thus, the idea of inherent good foreseen in those chosen or of anything meritorious performed by them is rigidly excluded. <clears throat> Excuse me. A, rigid, a remnant, according to the election of grace, signifies an unconditional choice resulting from the sovereign favor of God. In a word, it is, a absolute, it is absolutely a gratuitous election. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen, God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God, hath God chosen. Yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29 Three times over in this passage, reference is made to God's choice, and choice necessarily supposes a selection, the taking of some and the leaving of others. The chooser here is God himself, as said the Lord Jesus to the apostles, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. John 15 and 16 the number chosen is strictly defined. Not many wise after the flesh, not many noble, etc., which agree with Matthew 20 and 16. So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. So much then for the fact of God's choice. Now mark the objects of his choice. The ones spoken of above as chosen of God are the weak things of the world, base things of the world, and things which are despised. But why? To demonstrate the, and magnify His grace. God's ways as well as His thoughts are utterly at variance with man's. The carnal mind would have supposed that a selection had been made from the ranks of the opulent and influential. And influential. The amiable and cultured, so that Christianity might have won the approval and applause of the world by its pageantry and fleshly glory. Ah, but that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Luke 16 and 15. God chooses the base things. He did so in Old Testament times. The nation which he singled out to be the depository of his holy oracles and the channel through which he, the promised seed should come was not the ancient Egyptians, the imposing Babylonians, nor the highly civilized and cultured Greeks. No, that people upon whom Je Jehovah set his love and regarded as the apple of his eye were the despised nomadic Hebrews. So it was when our Lord tabernacled among men. The ones whom he took into favored intimacy with himself and commissioned to go forth as his ambassadors were, for the most part, unlettered fishermen, 
And so it has been ever since. So it is today. At the present rates of increase, it will not be long before it is manifested that the Lord has more in despised China, who are really his, than he has in highly favored USA. More among the uncivilized blacks of Africa than, than he has in cultured Germany. And the purpose of God's choice, the ransom d'etre of the selection he has made, is that no flesh should glory in his presence, there being nothing whatever in the objects of his choice which should entitle them to his special favors. Then all the praise will be freely ascribed to the exceeding riches of his manifold grace. Can't glory in anything of our own, only in God's grace. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, remember that, spiritual blessings, in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5 and 11. Here again, we are told at what point in time, if time it could be called, when God made choice of those who were to be his children by Jesus Christ. It was not after Adam had fallen and plunged his race into sin and wretchedness, but long ere Adam saw the light, even before the world itself was founded, that God chose us in Christ. God chose us in Christ before the world was founded. Here also we learn the purpose which God had before him in connection with his own elect. It was that they should be holy and without blame before him. It was also unto the adoption of children. It was also that they should obtain an inheritance. Here also we discover the motive which prompted him. It was in love that he predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. A statement, a statement which refutes the oft-made and wicked charge that for God to decide the eternal destiny of his creatures before they are born is tyrannical and unjust. Finally, we are informed here that in this matter he took counsel with none, but that we are predestined according to the good pleasure of his will. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chose you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 There are three things here which deserve special attention. First, the fact that we are expressly told that God's elect are chosen to salvation. Language could not be more explicit. How summarily do these words dispose of the sophistries and equivocations of all who would make election refer to nothing but external privileges or rank in service? It is to salvation itself that God hath chosen us. Second, we are warned here that election unto salvation does not disregard the use of appropriate means. Salvation is reached through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. It is not true that because God has chosen a certain one to salvation, that he will be saved willy-nilly, whether he believes or not. Nowhere do the Scriptures so re represent it. The same God who predestined the end also appointed the means. The same God who chose unto salvation decreed that his purpose should be realized through the work of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 
Third, that God has chosen us unto salvation is a profound cause for fervent praise. Note how strongly the apostle expresses this. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God, because God, that's why, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Love that. Because God, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, etc. Instead of shrinking back, that says hack, but it should say back. Instead of shrinking back in horror from the doctrine of predestination, the believer, when he sees this blessed truth, as it is unfolded in the word, discovers a ground for gratitude and thanksgiving such as nothing else affords save the unspeakable gift of the Redeemer himself. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 2 Timothy 1 and 9. How plain and pointed is the language of holy writ. It is man who by his words darkeneth counsel. It is impossible to state the case more clearly or strongly than it is, than it is stated here. Our salvation is not according to our works. It is to say... It is not due to anything in us, nor the rewarding of anything from us. Instead, is the res it is the result of God's own purpose and grace. And this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. It is by grace we are saved, and in the purpose of God, this grace was bestowed upon us not only before we saw the light, not only before Adam's fall, but even before that far distant beginning of Genesis 1-1. And herein lies the unassailable comfort of God's people. If his choice has been from eternity, it will last to eternity. Nothing can survive to eternity but what came from eternity. And what has so come will. George S. Bishop. I'm going to repeat that. It says, nothing can survive to eternity but what came from eternity and what has come will George S. Bishop elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the father through thank through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. First Peter one and two here again, election by the father precedes the work of the Holy spirit in and the obedience of faith by those who are saved, thus taking it entirely off creature ground and resting it on the sovereign pleasure of the Almighty. The foreknowledge of God the Father does not here refer to his, his pre-science uh, pre or pre-knowledge of all things, but signifies that the saints were all eternally present in Christ before the mind of God. God did not foreknow that certain ones who heard the gospel would believe it apart from the fact that he had ordained these certain ones to eternal life. What God's pre-science or saw or foreknowledge, what God's pre-science saw in all men was love of sin and hatred of himself. That's what God saw in all men. The foreknowledge of God is based upon his own decrees as it is clear from Acts 2 and 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Note the order here. First, God's determinate counsel, his decree, and second, his foreknowledge. So it is again in Romans 8, 28 and 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. But the first word here, for, looks back to the preceding verse 
And the last clause of it, of it reads, To them who are the called according to his purpose, these are the ones whom he did foreknow and predestinate. Finally, it needs to be pointed out that when we read in Scripture of God knowing certain people, the word is used in the sense of knowing with approbation and love. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. 1 Corinthians 8 and 3. To the hypocrites, Christ will yet say, I never knew you. He never loved them. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, signifies then, chosen by him as the special objects of his approbation and love. Summarizing the teachings of these seven passages, we learn that God has ordained to eternal life certain ones and that in consequence of his ordination, they in due time believe. That God's ordination to salvation of his own elect is not due to any good thing in them, nor anything, nor to anything meritorious from them, but solely of his grace. That God has designedly selected the most unlikely objects to be the recipients of his special favors, in order that no flesh should glory in his presence. That God chose his people in Christ before the foundation of the world, not because they were so, but in order that they should be holy and without blame before him. That having selected certain ones to salvation, he also decreed the means by which his eternal counsel should be made good. That the very grace by which we are saved was in God's purpose given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, that long before they were actually created, God's elect stood present before his mind, were foreknown by him, i.e. were the definite objects of his eternal love. Before turning to the next division of this chapter, a further word concerning the subjects of God's predestinating grace. We go over this ground again because it is at this point that the doctrine of God's sovereignty in predestinating certain ones to salvation is most frequently assaulted. Perverters, perverters of this truth invariably seek to find some cause outside God's own will which moves him to bestow salvation on sinners. Something or other is attributed to the creature which entitles him to receive mercy at the hands of the Creator. We return, we return then to the question, why did God choose the ones he did? What was there in the elect themselves which attracted God's heart to them? Was it because of certain virtues they possessed? Because they were generous-hearted? Sweet-tempered, truth-speaking, in a word, because they were good, that God chose them? No, for our Lord says there is none good but one, and that is God. Matthew 19 and 17. Was it because of any good works they had performed? No, for it is written, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. Roman 3 and, Romans 3 and 12. Was it because they evidenced and earnestness and zeal in inquiring after God? No, for it is written again, there is none that seeketh after God. Romans 3.11 Was it because God foresaw they would, that they would believe? No, for how can those who are dead in trespasses and sins believe in Christ? How could God foreknow some men as believers? when belief was impossible to them. Scripture declares that we believe through grace. Acts 18 and 27. Faith is God's gift, and apart from this gift, none would believe. The cause of his choice then lies within himself, and not in the objects of his choice. He chose the ones he did simply because he chose to choose them. Sons what we are by God's election. 
who on Jesus Christ believe by eternal destination. Sovereign grace we now receive. Lord, thy mercy doth both grace and glory give. I love you all, brothers and sisters. You have a blessed, wonderful day. Stay strong in the Lord. Jesus loves you.